Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're coming to you from our cottage at Lac Vert, Quebec. Now, a couple of years ago, we did an episode, one of our earliest episodes, from the cottage. Oh, that's right. And it was about unplugging. Uh, so we thought that this year we'd do another one, and we'd take advantage of the fact that we're at the cottage with my family, with my mother and father in particular, to talk to them about some of the topics that are of interest to this podcast and to us. So let me just start by saying the audio quality is going to be a little bit different, as you can already hear, because we're not in our fancy basement recording studio, otherwise known as our home office, at home, but in a bunkie at the cottage, which is full of wonderful reflective wood (laughs) (laughs) and not much else. So uh, apologies if you find it a little bit odd, but I'm sure you can cope. All right, so Susan McMaster is a poet who worked in publishing for most of her career, from founding editor of the feminist and arts magazine Branching Out to editor at the National Gallery of Canada. Her more than a dozen published books include Dark Galaxies, Hummingbird Murders, Learning to Ride, Crossing Arcs, Lizard Love, and Paper Affair Selected Poems. She has been a member of several groups that combined music and poetry, including First Draft and Geode. She has given numerous readings, school presentations, workshops, and classes, and she served a term as president of the League of Canadian Poets. My father, Ian McMaster, was a professor and then chair at Algonquin College in Ottawa, teaching programming in its various incarnations from 1977 to 2004. He did his graduate work in artificial intelligence and language learning, and his interest in those areas and continued over the years, as well as in jazz music, theatre, fishing, nature, construction, hunting, and more. So, welcome. Hello. Hi there. <laughs> So as you both know, our interest in this podcast is in connections, both intentional and serendipitous, and the way they shape how we learn, work, and understand the world. I think that both of you embody those ideas, um, not only because of your many and varied interests and your involvement in diverse communities, but by the way your, as it were, extracurricular interests have informed your creative work and your careers. Not to mention the fact that both of you have strong ties to the study of language, itself, of course, a central topic of this podcast. So we thought we could take advantage of our time here this summer to explore some of those connections with you. Okie doke. Sure. So to start off with then, Ian, do you have any one moment or example of serendipitous or intentional connections for us? Oh, that's an interesting question. I'm sure there have been many connections over the years. <laughs> no, I, I I can't think of any of the, of the kind that I read about or listen to in your uh, podcasts and in your uh, videos, for instance. There have often been uh, connections of people from various places. I meet someone in Nova Scotia who knows somebody that I know in Ottawa Mm-hmm. Or I come across a piece of trivia about trees that somehow connects with uh, something I learned about uh, fishing sometime. You know, that mm-hmm. that a certain flower blooms at the time when a, the trout are spawning. The trout lilies, I think, do that uh, around here. That's why they're called trout lilies. I can't really think of any sort of intellectual connections offhand, though there, I'm sure there have been thousands over my, my life. And I'm always fascinated when they when they occur. What about you, Mum? Do you well? There's one simple one. I had time to think, of course. Yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> when I got the job at the National Gallery, I was an editor. Uh, you can't make money running a feminist uh, literary magazine, so <laughs> I was looking for something else. Mm-hmm. And I was I met at my father's place uh, a woman he was seeing at the time, who became his wife, Ann Mitchell. And she introduced me to another friend, Linda Muir, of hers a friend of hers, who worked at the National Gallery Mm -hmm. as an editor. I'd never even heard of such a job, uh, editing catalogs. So we talked at that party. We didn't pay any attention to the party. And as a result, I sent in a 
an application and it wasn't paid any notice to until about two years later, at which point I got a sudden call. Hi, we need an editor. Come tomorrow to do a test. <laughs> and then when I did the test and they chose me, can you start on Monday? <laughs> well, no, I have other work. I have to give a little bit of, you know, warning. Yeah. And so I did and I found somebody else to fill my position and went to the gallery. But that turned out to be a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. and, and it was just accident, as I said. Didn't even know the job existed. Mm -hmm. I think that's true for a lot of people with a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only like yeah. four professions, you know, when you're a child, mm -hmm. fireman, doctor, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and most people don't do most of those jobs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's hard to know to apply for things that you don't even know exist. Mm -hmm. Well, it's perfect serendipity, and it led to many intellectual conversations. Mm -hmm. I met Ian when he was a teaching assistant at Carleton, and I was That's taking true. mathematics. Ooh, you're not supposed to introduce that unethical <laughs> behavior on my part. Uh, you were, yeah, 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 you were five years older than me only and a grad student, so anyway. somehow I think it was okay. <laughs> anyway, ethics. I got 32% in my first exam. So. Exactly, which proves that I was being ethical, I guess. <laughs> anyway, there, were, there were no... <laughs> there were no ethics in the teaching profession back then anyway. No. So that was, that was problem. before ethics. Yeah, before, before, we, the, before we discovered pre ethics. ethics. <laughs> well, the one that, that I thought of for you, Dad, was when you were choosing your graduate work. I did my undergrad. Uh, well, there's there's, there's, a, there's yeah. the connection. Okay, we, we could go back a little further than that. In high school, the uh, Carleton University Engineering Department came to all of the high schools in Ottawa and said, Send us your two most interested or top math students from that from each school and plus one teacher and come and take the uh, programming course with the engineers on a Saturday morning for, I believe it was eight weeks or something like that. So that'd be in... 1963. Yeah, okay. So programming when programming was point. not even heard of by most people. So we went along and learned how to do machine coding and Fortran on an IBM 1620, which was is, is a, a museum piece now, of course. And two or three years later, in applying for a summer job, I put that on my CV and it landed me a job as a programmer. So it was a, a very <laughs> serendipitous connection. I didn't really expect to get a job as a programmer, but mm -hmm. I did. And that led to my entire career as a programmer and, and programming teacher. So that was an interesting connection. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, you moved to Edmonton to get your master's degree a few years later with me after we got married and all that stuff. That's true. And that led to me being in a kind of intellectual wilderness in that Edmonton didn't have very much going on at mm -hmm. all. So we could have ended up in Toronto, say, or Montreal, mm -hmm. which was full of be nascent poets and mm -hmm. and seniors of, in the art world of all kinds and although there were some good people in in Edmonton there wasn't a community really or mm -hmm. very much there was hardly anything in feminism so when I wanted something to read or somewhere to go it was like a a, a nice welcoming juicy pool into which to plop my little frog body <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, start something interesting mm -hmm. you know so that was and, and people flocked uh, to the first meetings and so on because there wasn't much happening right. so that I consider to be great luck if I had landed in a big city I would have been swamped I'd probably never have published much poetry because maybe a bit here and there because mm -hmm. I did, just simply didn't yeah. have the confidence at the time and the interesting thing is that it's because of her frog body that I was initially attracted to her. <laughs> <laughs> so, and yeah, here we are in a lake full of frogs. <laughs> so how did the language aspect of computers come into it? Well, actually, that has something to do with... Hmm. I was going to say it has to do with Avon, but of course it predated Avon. Yes. <laughs> uh, but the, the, probably the, the things are related in other ways. I got to the University of Alberta thinking I was going to learn about systems and systems design. Well, it seemed that the computing science department there had no particular interest in that. That was something that IBM did or biz, people doing business computing would do, not people interested in the, the science of computers. So I had to look around and think, well, what, what am I actually going to be interested in here? And I took a course in syntax, formal syntax for computer grammars and syntax for computer languages. And that really sparked my interest in uh, in how language was structured. 
And so I looked around for supervisors in the department, and, and there was one person who was interested in language. He, had, he was supervising someone else who was doing something in language. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll do something there. And, I, and, more I, oh, and then I took a linguistics course to kind of eke out my knowledge in, in that, that area. And he talked about language learning by children, and I started reading about that. I got the idea that natural language understanding wasn't going to go anywhere until you had a system that could learn. You can't pre-program all of the knowledge and strange idioms and syntax and all of the weird things people do with language. You can't pre-program that. But you can, if you could produce a system that could learn in the way that a child does, then the sky's the limit because now they can absorb the language in a natural way and ostensibly become as good as a human. Or maybe better. So I we have many arguments about that or discussions. <laughs> discussions. Can poetry be written by that's a computer? Right, that's right. But anyway, I, you know that that whole question aside, I, it really interested me. So I started reading on it, and then I decided to do something on the modeling of the acquisition of language in a computer, based on the, the modeling of of, of of how a child learns language using a computer program, and that's what I did for my for my masters. Mm-hmm. And since then, of course, computers have had full natural learning capability and natural <laughs> right, language has advanced. Right. Well, as in, <laughs> as in men, with many things in artificial intelligence, there's a moving window of when we will achieve the, the <laughs> goal that has been set out. Oh, it'll be five years from now. Oh, it'll be. Oh, no, we get five years from now. And it, oh, oh and perhaps in another five to ten years. And then we get a little further down the road, and the, the, the goal just keeps being put off and off. So we're now finally, you know, in 2000 and uh, whatever we are, 17, 17 as far as which is what, uh, about 50 years later, we are finally at a point where natural language understanding by computers is reasonably good in, certain, in particular contexts. Mm-hmm. And uh, is it about the stage we thought we would get to it by 1970? You know, so uh-huh. um, we're just a little bit behind. I had someone ask me the other day, uh, "What's happening in in poet in with poetry and and uh, computers and other kinds of interactive things like that?" And you know, it must be a very interesting field right now. And I tried to think, and I thought, well, you know, there's one chap who's uh, trying to code molecules to be sent out into space with a word on them uh, that will somehow, he's calling it a poem, and that will somehow tell somebody that there's a a poetry universe here, which is, you know, an interesting idea, but very little idea in a sense. I mean, a big activity, a little idea. And I can't, not certainly not knowing everything about what's happening in poetry, but I can't think of anything interesting. People aren't very interested in that. They're interested in using the tools of computers mm-hmm. because of the limitations. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a book that came out at least uh, 20 years ago, which Ian and I picked up, of computer poetry called Computer Generated Poetry, mm-hmm. The Policeman's Beard is Half Constructed. I think that's it. Yeah, and it was more than 20 years ago. It was more like the 1970s. Anyway, it's, it's sort of pretty... neat, kind of absurdist stuff, but th- there's nothing much to it. But I don't think it's, in terms of the leaping arts and intellectual philosophies and so on, where you have to make not just connections, not just logical and rational connections, but an intuitive Mm-hmm. connection which comes in a sense from the body of the creator this is the argument that Ian and I had or discussion they really were discussions all along uh, I do think poetry can come from computers but I think it's going to be computer poetry because the validation of the poet poetic line as a line that does something to mm-hmm. other listeners is uh, comes from the body and from the subconscious and from the genetic model that we are built on, uh, partially, mm-hmm. as well as from the pure intellect and from the rational or even from the creative impulse as we can understand it, uh, which is essentially putting together things that are surprising. I, I think that might be the base of all real creativity, which is why the whole question of connectivity is interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm always interested in what actually gets me writing a poem, and it's not necessarily at all what one might think. <laughs> yeah, even from the end result of the poem. Yeah, 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 the poem poem wanders. And when I start doing a poem, writing one, it goes 
somewhere I don't know where it's going to go. And if it doesn't go in unexpected directions, I don't plan the poem ahead. Mm. Some people do. If it doesn't make connections between there and there that are really not what you would plan, then it's not a poem. It's a it's a discursive piece, or it might be a piece of comedy or a piece of whatever. Mm. piece of good writing, very possibly. But not a poem for you. Yeah, yeah. for me. Yeah. That's why one of the things I was thinking about, I was thinking about that um, initial overlap between computer programming and language mm-hmm. as being one of, and in my mind and my recollection of what you told me about that, as being one of those sort of somewhat um, unplanned connections that has been fruitful for you ever since. If not necessarily intellectual, I mean, it didn't necessarily change what you taught or how you, but in terms of things you've been interested in, because that interest in language has certainly persisted. Well, yeah, I mean, across, there's a crossover between uh, your understanding of the way natural languages like English are, are mm-hmm. put together and structured and, and the way programming languages mm-hmm. are structured. There are different kinds of languages in a sense in that there's a very formal and rigid grammar for uh, computer languages yeah. and they always obey the rules. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the compiler makes sure of that. <laughs> um, but whereas with, the, with natural languages... There, people like to construct rules, but that's not how, how people uh, speak. So, the, but there's a, there's an overlap between the two. So, mm-hmm. so there is a connection mm-hmm. uh, between my professional work and my personal interests. Mm-hmm. There's a connection between your use of language within programming and mine within poetry, because mm-hmm. although you're right that computers are very strict in their requirements, to my mind, so is language. If you are going to communicate. You need to communicate within the boundaries of the understanding of the community Mm -hmm. you're talking to. And so you have to use the tools or not use them or change them Mm -hmm. in a way which is meaningful, Mm -hmm. not just chaotic and foolish. So Ian and I are both equally interested in commas. Um, he, he within well we you look surprised <laughs> I'm thinking of like within within your when you were writing programs you know maybe I've got the wrong important. thing but a particular punctuation mark of some kind was terrifically important if you mm-hmm. missed it you, the thing didn't work and for me if I miss a comma or put them in put one mm-hmm. in when I haven't put others in the whole structure of what I'm doing is is disturbed for the reader at a different level than the straight surface level of consciousness. Uh, so there, there are links there. Gosh, comma, I never knew that we shared that particular interest, semicolon. I wonder where it came from, <laughs> period. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I think see that as being what, what you were saying is that when programming, the thing is there's all the rules and then you can't break them. In poetry, there's all the rules and then you intentionally sometimes break them or shift them. And that that becomes the play of creativity. And to a Mm. certain extent, that's one of the things that natural learning would have to be able to. I mean, that's not to a certain extent. That's a big part of what Mm. real natural language, if a computer could ever manage it, would have to understand is a way of knowing how to break and play with rules, which is fundamentally problematic for computers. Yeah, and change into a new rule. Well, and the, tra- it's the not child a rule. has it's an exception. Like well, often, it's, it's an exception, right? It's it's not that once you've done something different in a poem, now language does that. No, it's that it's always, as you say, the surprise or the change or whatever. Uh-huh. It's still comprehensible uh-huh. within a larger set of rules, but it's 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 an exception. It stands in as a, as an exception in a way that computers doesn't. Yeah, and and the child work with. see in in children's acquisition of language, their brains have to cope with. Any kind of experiment with language that mm-hmm. their parents or, or the, parents the world make. around them happens to do, or their new video game that they just got, yeah. they have to learn from that no matter how far outside the norm mm-hmm. it is, well, within reason. Um, and then they also have to do the really complicated task of generalizing from individual and then knowing when not to generalize. Mm-hmm. Or Which look, is... Scaling back the generalizations, because right. that's Wh- what children do. Which is why Ian tracked your language yeah. even when you were born and those yeah, well, that was the still connection. exist that somewhere. was the connection that uh, that <laughs> i mentioned head, earlier yeah. between the, the my language interest in language and you of course the time-worn story of going around the the the, <laughs> the house and sticking labels on everything in the in the room the piano the the keyboard the chair the table in big letters so that you would learn to read <laughs> by the age of I don't know, eight months or something like that. I, don't, I can't remember exactly what age, but it was a pretty precocious age. And and our, our neighbor John and good friend uh, 
was highly amused by this <laughs> approach to uh, child rearing. Well, we also have the, some of the early bo- journals you kept of my uh, progress through, you know, different oh, kinds of. Right. Uh, yes. different she's at the yeah. two. She's at the two two word stage now. Yeah. Or the, yes. Oh, bilabial fricatives. The have bilabial made the- fricatives <laughs> are coming out. Yeah. I don't think there's yeah. a, a linguist out there who hasn't felt that tempted to experiment on their child that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for sure. I didn't. I didn't really do much more intervention than the labels. Uh, really, I didn't. Uh, start and to start be prodding her neurons or anything like that. <laughs> or restricting the c- categories of uh, nouns you used around yeah, me to see right, what happened. Right. <laughs> Though we did restrict oh. some of our language when we had a child. Well, as, every, I think as most perhaps, people do. Yes, that's yeah. perhaps not most... purely restricted to linguists. No, I don't think <laughs> so. Uh, so. I'm fairly bad at that. But <laughs> um, Now, to be fair, your early experiment... I mean, I did learn to read pretty early, not eight months, but pretty yeah. early. So maybe with the sure absolute that, yeah. lack of statistical validation that a, a, an example <laughs> yeah. of one <laughs> gives you. Yeah, hardly. You, a, did hardly you do that for morale? Sample, did you do, do that for No, we didn't do that with morale. No, not that particular thing. No, well, we were still <laughs> and, interested in and language. And she might, might have taken at least to like age four to learn to read. So she was yeah. only interested. But she was in never the addictive, anyway. addictive our, reader our, that you were. Our uh, other daughter. So yeah. that, it, there may have been an influence. Yeah, so maybe my, it's all your fault. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as our credit to your credit. Yeah, you know, my interest in language is not exactly hard to trace back to mm-hmm. both of you, obviously, since sure. you've both been interested in and in both in professional and and personal capacities. You know, the fact that the dictionary had to be near at hand for oh, any yes. dinner time any conversation dinner time. because well, actually, it turned into things. etymology eventually. We had to have yeah. an etymological dictionary yes. too. That then. was my sixteenth birthday present that I, I requested. Remember that. <laughs> the I Oxford remember that, etymological yeah. dictionary. But, but let, but us, that was... let us not also forget the uh, the also time worn uh, story of us yes. actually being away for in Europe for six months and having no books except Graves, the Greek myths, yeah. uh, Shakespeare's some of Shakespeare's works. plays. Yeah. And the Bible, I believe. Shakespeare's and, 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 and Shakespeare's a, a book sonnets. On his selected works no. was too big. No. We had Wh- his sonnets. Whatever. Anyway, uh, so that led you to read you. Graves myths yes. over and over and over again. <laughs> Guess what your field is? Now. Yep, no, well, that one then, is definitely foundational. <laughs> and then, in a in a ter- desperate and dry period, when I was tired of reading Jung, which was really changing my dreams around to match what he thought I should be <laughs> dreaming, being a very suggestible type, I went into uh, Lisbon and bought about five at extremely high prices Agatha Christie's in English, which are about <laughs> as surface and you know non uh, Union. depth as one can get, and uh, read them all, and so did you, yeah. and we are both have read every Agatha Christie <laughs> that exists over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. Mark, how does this fit with your experiences I, of childhood I don't have language? Any, yeah, I don't have any sort of foundational event like that. Yeah. Though my my grandmother, my father's mother, quite early on did tell me about how etymology worked and she pointed out you know sanskrit words and uh english words are similar here and here and here so i i do remember from that mm-hmm. well you and have parents you have with interest. with yeah. two different languages french and uh, yeah that, i mean that's the, the unusual thing is and... that my first language is not the first language of either of my parents mm-hmm. uh-huh. which is oh yeah probably an unusual but was, yeah, was your father's language was it hindu was it it was Tamil. Tamil, Tamil. Yeah. yeah, which is not not the same. Which is not Indo-European. It is not Indo-European. No. Tamil. Did you ever learn very much of no, it? None, none really. None really. No. That's too bad. Yeah. You did learn some French, I think, because yeah. you saw the French relatives. Yeah. yeah. But you learned the and French learned, in school. Learned French in school, of course. Mm. It so, wasn't really yeah. a family. It wasn't the language at home. So. No, yeah. but that the whole interest in knowing different languages uh, for children to know different languages, which has come out of mm-hmm. both your kids, who are not only learning. <laughs> you have a son learning German, another <laughs> son learning Spanish, both learning French, and one of your sons is making up his own language yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, they've gotten very into Duolingo. <laughs> very yeah. into Duolingo, yeah. But this is a you know our mm. your generation and to our, an extent our generation became interested Val- in, in having valuing more than multiple. Multilingual, yeah, yeah. and I. But I think some of the uh, older my parents didn't have a particular interest. They didn't. Well, mind when with your parents, it was more of a pragmatic thing that neither of them ever. I I, I can understand why had the sort of energy to learn the other person's first, first language, language yeah. and anyway, sort of which way should it go at that mm-hmm. point? I suppose. Mm-hmm. Your father might have learned French because he was in Canada. You know, that yeah. could have could have been something as a government worker in mm-hmm. Canada. He might have 
tried, but but he didn't. And so because neither of them learned each other's first language, had you learned either of them to a large extent, it would have almost been yeah. a, an odd dynamic. Odd because, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you learned French in school, so that was that. But had you, I don't know, you, if you only you and your dad could speak Tamil yeah, and no one right. else in the family could. Right, right. Oh, that'd be that wonderful, becomes... a secret language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so there's, a, there's a different kind of pressure on there, apart from just yeah. whether or not you want to become multilingual. Mm-hmm. Well, working mm-hmm. as an editor at the gallery... Mm-hmm. National Gallery. Of course, we had to work in both French and English. My French was nowhere up to it, and to to edit at that level was hard to do unless it was your first yeah. language. Yeah. And so there were French editors and English editors, yeah. and we worked together. So it was actually a wonderful experience because you discover which words say are spelled the same but have a different meaning. Yeah. Important. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the same as important. It, uh, I can't remember what its meaning is now, but I know it's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's and a lot it, of those, sort of or have different kind of... feeling um, of, of the French and how yeah, it would flows Yeah, in different more. idioms or... Yeah, yeah, the idioms, the words, the structures, the feeling of it, the expressiveness of it. And, and, and my job and the French editors were to match across so that the content was essentially the same, but sometimes mm-hmm. the expression was very different. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. So a few of my poems include some French uh, words mm-hmm. or phrases. The other thing that was a major influence on my interest in language, uh, curiously, and this may have uh, had a long trickle-down effect <laughs> to you eventually, was that when I was in uh, high school, I at Fisher Park High, I took five years of Latin. Yeah, right. Which introduced me to, you know, all the rigorous structures of Latin, mm-hmm. which, of course, carry over to English in a mm-hmm. number of ways, and got me interested, even though I, I'd had a little bit of interest in language because my father took a German course about 1950 in England, mm. a night course, and he had a few books from that course. And I remember reading them and getting interested in a couple of songs that were in them and uh, some of the grammar. Mm-hmm. But then, then the Latin really laid down a structure. So I, I, I became, you know, the, the typical pedant after that, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> taking all that Latin and correcting everybody's uh, use of the of grammar and uh, and words, and also interest in etymology because you you you, you quickly realize how many words yeah. have obviously come from Latin. So so that sort of led to my it, it trickled down to all of these things in my mm-hmm. uh, my career and my my intellectual interest and. Hence to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, well, and, and I was thinking about that. Of course, one of the things that both of you did, you said you changed your language when you had kids, as people do. And I know you did, but you also didn't remove all of the oddnesses of your no, sort of, no, no. you know, of, of any that any family has of, of private language or whatever. But I think you had maybe more oddnesses than some. So a fair number of those carried over to mine. Yeah, that's, that's right. Either so, things like... To wave and, and yeah, uh, yeah. you know, but there were other, yeah, we did actually quite change even that aspect, not just yes. the expletives, but the incomprehensibility of the things we said to each other. But some other. of them we carried did, over. Some carried over, mm-hmm. yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's Fam- one uh, famous example of Misel. Misel, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Which many yes. people, as I have found in the world, many people who found, first saw the word misled in, mm-hmm. bo- in books also thought it was misled. So I've, uh-huh. I've, heard, I've heard multiple people say that they've. Yeah. Good, I don't feel alone anymore. No, <laughs> but what happened to me that didn't happen to them was that you guys used that word in oh, you in conversation me again. and sure. in full in a fully yeah. conjugated verb. You didn't just uh-huh. say you misled me, but you'd say don't misle me and yeah, yeah. oh, you're misling me. Thereby misling you yes. for the rest of your life. <laughs> exactly. So that it was not just one, you know, misread no, uh, pronunciation, uh, you know, that happens to many people, but a completely constructed element of my language. <laughs> <laughs> a verb in yeah. your vocabulary. Yes. So, yes. so that really did. <laughs> and there were others too. I yes. can't there, even so remember. Slowly so over my teenage to 20s, I started to realize <laughs> how, how, not, how did. many <laughs> words that, that I thought were normal words were not normal or phrases or idioms. Yeah. <laughs> Did that ever happen to you? That probably happened without you recognizing it, because both your parents not being native speakers Mm -hmm, of English. mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. their English is good, of mm -hmm. course, but, you know, your dad had certain idioms. Or pronunciations. Yeah, pronunciations that were different. And And we all say pronunciation, not (laughs) pronunciation. (laughs) (laughs) All in our own way, still slightly pedantic. (laughs) Pedantic. And I see every word I speak in my mind. I see see it spelled out. I mean, it's always there. I don't pay attention to it most of the time. <laughs> 
Well, the other overlap that I am particularly interested in is music and language. Yes. And I know that's something that, Susan, you've worked on quite a bit. Uh huh. Music was always in my family, and my parents valued classical music. I remember listening to it on the radio and things like that. I found it kind of boring because it was all being, what was being played was mainly the romantic uh, Beethoven. I mean, they were good pieces, but they were being played over and over again, the same pieces. But they were in the wave that discovered folk music as a big thing. Mm -hmm. And we began singing as a family deliberately. My parents deliberately did that moved into the beat era and we all sang as you you know mm. and in harmony and so mm. on just for the pleasure of it my mom sang all the time and the direct effect of that on me is that the words of folk music are distilled a, a real folk song usually has dropped many many of the infelicities of the phrasing it's dropped the unnecessary mm. verses mm -hmm. the story is implied yeah. and it the words fit the the rhythm and the shape of the intonation extremely well and very satisfyingly. And that four-line structure of what are really beautiful words, even if they're extremely simple, underlies my poetry, all of my poetry. It's always there. You can find it if you look for it, even though it does. my poetry doesn't look like that on the page. The rhyming element too <clears throat> is there, but in my poetry, it's subsumed. You don't. It's it's tucked within mm -hmm. the sounds of the poems. I don't do much end, end rhyme, though. I have a few pieces who do that do that. So that was that's been a very powerful thing for me. Very emotional. Mm -hmm. Those songs were how I, you know, I never will marry, <laughs> or love, oh love, oh careless love, or well, I, it's a long and a dusty road. You know that beautiful. Beautiful phrase. It's mm -hmm. long and a dusty road, a hard and heavy load. That's not a folk music, but it's within but the it same of, idi it, idiom. Yeah, it comes and out of that in the same way you're talking about your poetry coming out of it. It's people who learned that kind of approach, writing yeah. and then and then made were part writing. of yeah. our teenage and growing mm -hmm. up years mm -hmm. in learned pop music. But I still stuck really to the folk music side. Never had much mm -hmm. uh, pop music exposure. So that um, means that for me, words, beautiful words, were always infused with musical elements. Mm -hmm. And I've had people say to me that once they've heard me read a poem, from then on, they always hear my voice when, I, when they're reading a poem of mine. Mm -hmm. And that if they haven't heard me read, it's less comprehensible, less satisfying for them. Mm -hmm. So that's the basis of it. Mm -hmm. And then from that, it was really quite simple. Uh, my brother was a musician and composer and he was lonely I was lonely and we were in our craft and very unsure of ourselves so we kind of got together when we were both very young and started to play a bit and talk a bit about the creative aspects of both which led to the very first word music pieces in which he took the words and manipulated the melodic and rhythmic elements and also put them together in several voices but notate it so it wasn't just okay let's all riff on uh, mm -hmm. on this line of poetry which is another line of poetry called psalm poetry but my work was uh, bp nico used to call it classical mm -hmm. he said you're classical we're jazz <laughs> so yeah because it was it wasn't improvisational it was structured and notated uh, yeah, like and the, music but yeah. without uh, for people who don't know word word music that you're talking uh -huh. about words and the use of the voice written as if it were music yes as music but without melody in a traditional yeah, sense. Spoken, so there's, so it, you're not singing. That's no. the, the difference, you know, so the difference mm -hmm. in terms of what someone might think. It's not just putting words to music. Right. It's making the natural and use spoken. of the voice, of the spoken voice, yeah. annotating it as musical elements. It's the full range of speech effects. Which yeah. Speech effects. yeah. And speech including features. timbre and, and yeah, uh, pitch and, and, and everything else. And no, you know, yeah. noises like using a sibilant or you know, yeah. something like that. So Yeah, and it can be married we with can. music because of the form shadowless on black shadowless, shadowless on, on black spruce shadowless on black spruce on black strike spruce on black spruce strike on black spruce on black spruce on black 
Well, I did that for 10 years, and then that group, which was first draft, um, split up as groups do. Somebody moved to Toronto and so on. And uh, I spent a few years simply writing page poems because the page poem is still the element for me. In a great deal of what you see in performance poetry now and in music and poetry, because there's a lot of it around now, it's a joint improvisation. Yeah, it's a stage. It comes you know, about it, on the stage, whether it's, right. it's a real stage. That's right. And the, uh, yeah. yeah. And so the what's said is an interactive thing if there is two if there are two or more musicians, writers, creators, or it's a comes out of the air as you do it. And I've always needed to have the words in front of me with my internal sense of rhythm and fitting them, and then I can give it to a, a musician to to do something with. And <clears throat> I want them, this is for me what's most important, I want a composer, uh, and I've, I've been lucky to have a number of composers work with my words, to go further than accompaniment. Mm. I don't want it just to match what I'm doing. And because my structures play with that four-line verse, so that sometimes it's not four lines, sometimes mm. it's three. Even the buried structure is, you know, I using the spaces and dropping and changing things. You can't just lay down a nice walking bass behind it and have it work. But I want the composer to bring something very different and rich to it, as well as accompanying, you know, being part of it. Mm -hmm. I remember doing one piece about called The Pleasure of Lusting, which is a this poem is a very, as you might imagine, sensual and sort of sexy poem. The pleasure of lusting after you, etc., etc. <laughs> and uh, so I read it to the group of musicians I was working with. This was at that point Sugar Beat, which became Geode. And the keyboardist, uh, Jennifer Giles, immediately instead of putting a sort of oh, da, 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 background to it which is what i would have imagined she started going do 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 seven offbeat uh, and very driving mm -hmm. and and quite uh, excitable rhythm to it so i thought am i supposed to match that and she <laughs> said no no you keep the way you're doing it and this is going to be behind it works like a charm mm -hmm. i think that piece yeah but But that was a big surprise to me. And that's what I love about working with another creator mm -hmm. in another mm -hmm. medium, whether it's art or music or mm -hmm. dance. Yeah, and you've done a lot of your work has, has been used by others or you've done a collaboration. And a fair amount of it has also just been picked up and used by other mm -hmm. artists who wanted to, sure. to use it as a part of their work. But Lizard Love, which is what's just come out, <laughs> is all about sort of a history of other people who've used your poetry to do their art. Yeah, it's a starting uh, it's point, a starting or, point or, or something that's incorporated it into it, it or, visual art in this case. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's and clearly, in a couple of cases where I saw the pieces be so much like some of my work. That you've adopted that it. I think, can I please put this in the book? <laughs> oh, all right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it's a, in that way, it's sort of a history of your, of the, those kinds of connections that you Across and other people art, have yeah, seen yeah. within your work. Is, is there any work in that book? Book that was actually a deliberate I'm going to write this piece and you're going to do a piece of art collaboration from the beginning? Yes, there's one. Uh, Roberta Hubner asked me to write a piece about September 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Right, oh, so she asked, I didn't know she that she asked, asked me to write, piece. And I wrote several pieces for it. I found it hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, in the end I wrote, uh, of the pieces I sketched out, she took a very short piece, a haiku. Mm -hmm. But that I, I wrote her piece of art. for yeah. her. Right. And I currently have another fine composer, John Armstrong, who's done a lot of work with my work, but has 
played a beautiful guitar series for me and wants me to write poems to it oh, as it turn it around. And I've been struggling with that for it must be nine months now. Hmm. I've got pages and pages of uh, somehow it, it, it hasn't caught with me. You know what? Art is the next step. It goes through somebody's mind, like rea- the raw reality mm-hmm. is there. And then it goes through another mind and it comes out and you can collaborate with that or you can maybe I can inspire it or something. But for me, I've never wanted to write ecrastic poetry, poetry that responded to another artwork. Mm-hmm. Although there's some wonderful ecrastic poetry. I've never been inspired by listening to jazz. Uh, I know people who have. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not. A, it, it doesn't work like that for me. I feel like there's another voice in there that's already said what needed to be said. And so I could accompany that. I'm, I'm, right. I am doing a reading with a composer whose work I don't know at all in a couple of weeks. And I will be, he'll be doing his pieces. I'll be doing mine. We have some general themes, but they're separated. Right. Yeah. But we're, it's you're going not, to be a surprise. We'll yeah, have you're to not see composing what, your poetry on no. the spot in response yeah. to what or he's Or showing do. it yeah. to him or he yeah. to me. Yeah. This is uh, actually... It will be more that the audience will be making yeah. making the story out of exactly. what those two yeah. things come and this together. is a, a poet yeah. i'm and uh, sorry a musician i met at banff stack pulak in ottawa has just started a new series called don't get let me get this right hashtag nsf not safe for work work <laughs> nsfwcc yes. contemporary concerts and he said i want surprise Right. He said, I don't want this all to be set up. I want to find out what happens. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of, you know, that's, that's a me. different kind of collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. like that. I think that's a great uh, movement. Yeah. So, for, but for you, you don't find that, that another artist in whatever field work gives you a spark for no, yourself. You I, need to, I, you need I to interact kind of more directly. Bad yeah. about that. <laughs> I, it, it seems sort of self centered or, you know, but. I just, it what doesn't is, what work is. for me. <laughs> <laughs> I need the raw stuff. <laughs> it's interesting because one of the earliest works that I remember of yours is where, somewhere where you did respond, I mean, on the one hand to the world, but you responded to other writing, not creative writing. Oh, to science. To, science, to, to scientific writing, which oh. I realize that that's not the same thing as responding to another artistic interpretation of the world. Mm-hmm. But in a way, that is a book where you were interacting with other with people's language. interpretations of reality. Mm-hmm. But and just because it was a very different field. But so, very much mm-hmm. with language. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very much. It was the words of you Scientific know, American, yeah. I have had, there's a poem that uses the word quirky, which, of course, I made up, but mm-hmm. Quirk is the basis of it. And that poem has been republished several times, and people keep changing it to quirky. But it's not quirky, <laughs> it's quirky. <laughs> yeah, and so that book was, um, I think of it as inspired by Scientific American, but I think that's perhaps reductionist. No, it was it's, not, absolutely, it, it's absolutely true. Yeah. I, You know, I... I I pick at different fields. That, and Scientific American is that, in a way, that's your contribution to that book, isn't that's it? That's my that's... connection. Yes, yeah, because I, I, I've been subscribing to Scientific American since I don't know somewhere yeah. in the seventies. And, Since we were uh, all babies. And at, at one time, I owned an entire collection dating back to 1951, which wow. somehow I inherited from somebody else's basement. <laughs> um, I eventually ended up ditching the, the, the collection many years later. But uh, but yeah, yeah my, my side of Americans became a sporadic reading matter for Susan, which then um, in, became fodder. inserted... Mm-hmm. Uh, itself into my yeah, into words have sometimes been uh, mm-hmm. been inspired, mm-hmm. inspired because that so that's one of those places where there's a connection between perhaps to an outsider surprising sure. elements right because that book is dark galaxies it's about well it's about many things but it's inspired by discussions of dark matter or the early reports on and theorizing and speculation about dark matter and I don't know dark energy. I don't think they'd started talking about dark no, energy by that no, point. No, no. Just dark matter. And also and simply the by the universe. words. Yeah. Simply by Those the words. The surprising use of words. Quantum words. Yeah. Yeah. Science songs number one. On perceiving a stable environment. The world shifts as he moves through. He approaches. It expands. Passes. It turns. Nods. It alters. alters. Elegant and precise are the compensations for movement of the eye, for movement of the head, for movement of the field, of the world as a whole. So adaptable is the universe to a self-centered man.
Yes, I've had some people totally love that book as a, a scientifically uh, based poetry. Mm-hmm. And I've had others say, well, your science is all wrong. You haven't got it right. right. <laughs> and perhaps I haven't got it perfectly right. But in an ex- extrapolating way, mm-hmm. it does. it is still correct as far yeah. as I know. Yeah, and it's got the little intros for some of the poems that are yeah, that was from... They were in there because at uh, that time people didn't... No. It was such cutting edge. They never heard of yeah. dark matter. But this is back instance. in the eighties, so you know now everybody knows what a dark hole, a black hole is. You don't mm-hmm. need to explain it. Yes, everybody knows what dark matter is. You don't yeah. need to yeah. explain it. But then I really did. Yeah. I, in a, when I did spend some time in Banff recently and talked to a bunch of musicians, they weren't nearly as interested in my poetry and music work where I would read a poem and, and creative musicians would build a, a something around it. Although I claim that it's not cliched what we were doing at all, but um, they're much more interested in the word music, which is actually using the words as music yeah. and notating them in a way that could be blended with music. Yeah, and so there's, using uh, the there's tools a, of music... And applied and to, the understanding yeah. of the spoken voice, not mm-hmm. of Sprechstimme or any of the musical systems, you know. So there's a young man on the on the east coast who's working with my my it's not my system. It was developed by my brother Andrew McClure, doing a piece that incorporates that notational right. system. Right. That's what interested them. Just having nice music and poetry together is pretty usual now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, working with Ian, it was. Interesting, because um, when we used to go to parties, if they had art people there, arts people there, uh, I'd introduce them. Oh, hi, what do you do? Uh, I'm a computer programmer. Well, he wouldn't say it like that. (laughs) No, it would be far more erudite than that. uh, Yeah, Yeah, I'd say I'm a computer programmer, and then the The conversation would trail off to some other part part of the room. Yeah, (laughs) because they would just sort of gently turn away. Because it sounds like it's just no idea. Boring and and or they don't know what it is, and yeah, yeah. And but now, now, or even in the last uh, couple of decades, they hear he's a computer programmer. Every artist in any field wants to talk to him (laughs) because the computer is so integral to how... As a tool. Yeah. As a tool, yeah. and uh, so many people are using Which it. Which is a bit fast. sad since my knowledge of computing has dropped off radically since I... Uh, <laughs> since you retired, ceased yeah. become It ceased being a prof, a prof at Algonquin. Yeah, but so. your knowledge of, not of the different tools that have been yeah. developed, but as we were saying earlier, your knowledge of the structural concept of how you use an electronic and the sort of basic tool. problems that underlie what you might want to yeah, do. Yeah, I like to think that I'm still there. I may be deluding myself, <laughs> but, you know, but you know, probably true. Thinking about um, what we were talking about, connections of intellectual to work, you had a lot of other hobbies and interests, some of which you developed after you retired, but many of which have been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. But uh, it seems to me that specifically, I mean, you were a computer programmer, but you were a teacher. First and foremost, yeah, yeah. really, in most of your career, what you were was a teacher. It's true. It, the way, the, the way it, it worked it, was it, uh, it getting a, a job as a TA, uh, you know, in the mm-hmm. second year of university, which many people do, mm-hmm. to put some money in their pocket yeah. or put gas in the car. I realized that I enjoyed it. And then years later, as I was getting bored with my job as a programmer, and yeah. Sue said, well, you've got to do something else. What are you interested in? Teaching was the thing that mm-hmm. sprang to my mind. Well, it and, did. And then, and then, serendipity. And then there was a sudden three weeks ad. later. Three yeah. weeks later, there was an ad in the newspaper. There's a serendipitous thing. Yeah. For two profs at Algonquin College, and I. You applied. Yeah. Applied, and they, I wasn't their first choice, but <laughs> I managed to be their second choice, and the other guy didn't uh, didn't, didn't want it. it. So yeah. Yeah, there, there we are. And it seems to me that it doesn't matter what you're teaching, as you as we all know, as all of us have been teachers. You've been a teacher as well. Uh, mm-hmm. professionally but also yeah. you know in a, in a uh, like workshops and things like that yeah, you've done a lot of teaching so. doesn't matter what you're teaching many of the skills are the same and one of the things that ended up becoming a passion of yours for a little while was uh drama oh yeah theater and i yeah. think mm-hmm. i think that's sure. a place where you can see a real overlap oh yeah in yeah well you did it yeah, even yeah. if you didn't think of it that way at the time the other thing the other, the other connection let's just draw another connection is that as i was growing up in england 
my parents had the radio on all the time oh, yeah, and yeah. the the programs that they would listen well they, they listened to a, anything that was on the BBC and a lot but a lot of the programs were comedy programs like the goon show and Jimmy Edwards and a uh, much binding in the marsh <laughs> uh, things that are you can probably look up on YouTube these days from the late 40s and, and 50s and I started to imitate accents and, uh, yeah, and, that's and right. to yeah. sort of put on the, the, the things that were going on on the radio I uh, reproduced them with my own voice and that gave me an interest in the uh, I guess the, the theatrical skills mm -hmm. which then came, started to come out a little bit in the teaching uh, assistant uh, job and then teaching and then uh, of course when I started to think about doing theater mm -hmm. It almost seemed like a natural, yeah. a natural extension of what I'd uh, learned as a kid. Yeah, I mean that's in a way a different uh, element of the how to use the voice or what to do with the voice. Word music sort of takes the natural expressiveness of the voice of a person's idiot, you know, normal, mm -hmm. and then formalizes it. Yeah, you know, yeah. Get, giving you saying take Observes the tools you already have and then it, yeah. and then use it. Accent learning it does the same thing, but it, it it you you take what you have and then you find you figure out what. What are the formal aspects of another language? Well, an interest actually it was this. There's actually a funny story that does mm -hmm. exactly that uh, from my er early theater. I think it may have been my first part. My first part was in a production of uh, the Inspector General. Yes. It's had <laughs> a couple of titles, but it, the Gogol's play, and it was being produced at the uh, Little Theater by uh, an oddball director, a very funny Irish guy. I had two speaking lines, and they were both uh, in German, and they were only three or four words long. I think one of them was "ja garlic gut," <laughs> and then and then the another one a immortal, little bit later. Immortal dialogue. <laughs> but he, he, the, the director was very bored with these uh, these phrases, and he said, "Well, no. What I want you to do is just start making up German on the stage <laughs> while the other action is going on, and just keep going." And I thought, "Well, all right." <laughs> um, so I started doing this. I started spouting German uh, according to my understanding of the phonetics, which I, I had a little bit of uh, knowledge in, in that area because of my father, as I said, and also because I took German 15 in Car at Carlton and failed it at Christmas. <laughs> well, I ended up getting a D minus, which was fine. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 I had knowledge of the underlying phonetics. So I, I just started spouting it. Ja, unter schneigen meinen unter pflegen paar, wo schneinen sie in der itzen meinen. It came out differently every night, but it was fun. And mm -hmm. so I used my, my some mm -hmm. linguistic knowledge. The, the funny part is that a woman in the audience complained one night at the box office because she said that wasn't real German that he was speaking. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was, that was not what, quite understanding. That was my, Google, my beginning in the, the in the theater world, and then yeah. I went, and then all all of my roles thereafter were accented roles, yeah. either in, with an English accent or Irish accent. Yeah. So I was using the skills that I learned listening to the Goon Show <laughs> in my uh, yeah. Yeah, that's theater. something that I I didn't get from. I mean. Morel, my sister, because she was interested in theater for quite a long time, did it sort of consciously, but she's pretty good at accents. Oh, too, yeah, she's yeah. always been interested in accents. And she can she, do them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. At least with yeah. a little study yeah. or a little yeah, work. No, she's and pretty I good. can't she's at all. And neither can I. I. I do that thing of unconsciously picking up accents. So mm -hmm. if I'm around people with a strong accent, I fall into the speech patterns, but I can't do it consciously. <laughs> I've occasionally had people think I was mimicking them. Yeah, well, when we and travel, Ian has Ian them. is the Yeah, that, that happens to me when I'm traveling. I, I, I end up starting to speak with a Liverpool accent or, or yeah. a Lancashire accent or, or a Cockney accent. In fact, I once did it intentionally. I sat in a, in a pub in London when we were there for, I think, my honey, our honeymoon, and I was sitting in the pub, and I started talking to the guy next to me, with a Cockney accent, uh, well, yeah, uh, we're on our honey honeymoon and uh, we're going up to Scotland after this and uh, going on about how this is a nice pub you got here. And I went on like this for about 15 minutes and then switched to Canadian and said to the guy, well, actually, I'm a Canadian. And he was not amused at all. <laughs> well, he didn't believe you. He didn't, he didn't actually punch me out, but... I, yeah, I, but he I, did, I realized he? that was probably not a very strong Probably thing. not. But he actually didn't believe it. He didn't believe I was Canadian when and I And then when he I thought he was taking the mickey. Then, but yeah, Ian, yeah. Ian has always been able to pick up languages very mm -hmm. quickly. I can't, which relates, if you want, back to the fact that I can't respond to somebody else's art. Voice, I don't yeah. know. I'm just 
me who I am and it doesn't vary very much and I can bring that to other situations but you're more of a I won't don't want to say chameleon because not really but you can uh, react to the environment yeah I tend to mirror what whatever, whatever it happens to be whereas uh, I tend ways, to yeah. bring my own irascible yeah. self into every context yeah. mm, yes. well I think that and that perhaps has to do <laughs> somewhat with the intestine <laughs> drama in the theater for instance because yeah. like again I, I I've always I like theater fine, but I've never had a, the slightest impulse to act. Mm-hmm. Partly because I can't really imagine acting. You know, I, I, I can try- imagine standing online and saying lines. Like I like reading poetry or doing a play reading or something. Like I can imagine reading material in a way that is meaningful to me. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. within a very small scope of roles that might like overlap strongly with my own personal experience. But you, but you can't imagine inhabiting can't, a character. Yeah, and, I can't imagine saying, trying to be somebody I'll else. I'll be this doing other something. person. Yeah. You, yeah. Well, you, you have. I mean, you've done a lot of it theater, but that is something bit, yeah. of some interest mm-hmm. to you. Well, you do you take on roles. Yeah, you you have a. You know, I would always always thought you you have a, a, a theatrical. Yeah. Yeah, uh, flavor to, you. to your yeah, personality. Yeah. The, yeah, and I think that also it's a performer element. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah, yeah. Much, much musical performance. Yeah, 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 but the music the, performance. And the thing about that is, I, as a teacher, I don't think I'm dramatic, but I do definitely think of teaching as performing. Mm-hmm. I'm very much a performative, like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm on... But you're performing you. But I'm performing <laughs> me. I'm not, yeah, exactly. Right. I'm not performing anybody else. I'm performing me, probably to the discomfort of my students sometimes, the sort of level of... Meanness. Meanness. <laughs> I will put out, you know, I'm happy to say things about myself that they maybe don't want to hear and things, but I'm happy to do that. So it's a performance. It's not me in normal life. It's me performing, yeah. but it's just me performing. I think yeah. you do that too, Mark. Don't but you, you put so, on, you're I, a bit more I, of a professor, being I, a professor. Yeah, I have a sort of persona, a, a version of me that I mm-hmm. portray when I, when I lecture, I think. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, almost like a, linguist, extent, a language register. Uh, yeah, you you, yeah. you take on that register on that for that. Register. Yeah. I mean, to some extent, that's what I'm doing too. It, these yeah. are not cut and dry dif- mm-hmm. differences, but I do think you you've got more of a sort of. It's a little more like I don't mean an act in a bad way, but just hey, more well, of a, a conscious. Persona. I am putting yeah. on a persona, yeah. whereas yeah. for me, it's just a matter of sort of increasing the amplifying. level, amplifying what I would do yeah. normally. And yeah. the poetry, many many poets have moved on to become fiction writers. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. Yeah. Because I'm Again, not, you... all the poems are not about me. In fact, I hope many of them aren't about me, you know, confessional mm-hmm. but poems. But they're of you. But they they're come of, of you. Yeah. me. And taking on a, a series of characters and moving. Uh, I would say that I have a fair degree of ability to feel empathy and to mm-hmm. feel myself inside another person. But I just can't do that. I, just the thought of it. Bores me silly. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you read fiction. It, I read fiction you know, voraciously. Yeah, exactly. And it's not I that you don't like it. it. I just... love stories. And... But you do perform, definitely, and you perform well. Oh, I perform. When you were talking about I yourself reading. Me. Yeah, you perform you, again, a, a, an amplified version of yourself, mm. a, a, a curated version of yourself, which is what mm. one does that's when one performs. Yeah. I think that's mm-hmm. appropriate. And I was thinking of that when you talked about you reading your poetry, because I was remembering thinking about how many poets there are out there who read their own poetry so poorly. (laughs) Not all, of course, but I mean, there are, and there's some fairly famous examples of poets who just, you know, and even older poems too, you you get those amazing early, early recordings of wax cylinder recordings of some of the early poets of Tennyson. But but I've listened to other poets read, and it's the sort of thing that people, put some people off poetry because for sure the reading of it is so there have been many many parodies of the canadian poet speak yeah Uh, and it is and it is funny to me because you'd think naively one might think that somebody who had written very good poetry would be the best person to read said poetry aloud and it turns out no (laughs) in europe and when i was in italy for example with the they all provided a reader I was not supposed to read the poetry. I was there to be there and maybe to answer questions. In one of the events, I insisted on standing up and reading a poem because I said, you've got to hear my voice, even if you don't understand the words. Most of the people there were academics and did understand English. But there was a very delightful actress who was there to read my poetry and did a very good job of it. And we talked Mm. about the one I was going to read, so she read it too. I, as a poet, do not particularly like hearing poets read. Mm. It depends on the poet. Yeah. But often I'm just irritated or bored. I guess I'm an easily bored person. That's come up often, hasn't it? (laughs) 
Well, we should probably draw to a close because we've kept you. I know you have important construction projects to do. See, I told you you had connections. Oh yeah, yes, they they they, 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 they are there. I just as you think you about can't them, yeah. necessarily consciously uh, mm-hmm. sum them up uh, uh, on demand. No, and yeah. it, and well. I think that's one of the things that we've found interesting about the podcast is if when you it ask yeah. when you ask somebody that question, you your response is very similar to what many people have. They say, "Well, I'm sure that's." Sure, there's been some in my life, but I can't think of them. Mm-hmm. But then if you start asking them about specifics, everyone we've talked to has realized, oh, well, but there's this and there's that and there's this. And, and you I... don't necessarily track it in your own life. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, thanks so much for joining <laughs> yeah, us and, yeah, and chatting welcome. with us. It's been yeah, fun. How, how it's been fun. Uh, and for providing the cottage as a backdrop. Yes. Mm, yes. Well, we built this bunky specifically so you could do this. Uh, yeah. Recording so. studio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Now we just need the uh, egg carton lining Save the walls. Save your egg cartons. <laughs> I burned them. It'll take us about 50 years. <laughs> well, maybe when you insulate it, it'll help. <laughs> All right. So we'll be back. I guess that this is going to come out in August. August, the end of August, and we'll be back on to a new season, as it were, I guess. We don't really do seasons, but I guess September can start a new season. Sure. Sure. So we'll be back, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in September, and I have no idea what we'll be talking about next time, because I'm at the cottage, and I don't do forward planning at the cottage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.